of the THS SBIR program. And I'm happy to be bringing you the 12th episode of Deconstructing SBIR, a title of today's episode, Who Understood the Assignment? So we're hoping by the end of this webinar episode, there'll be some more folks that understand the assignment. Um, Today we have a fantastic guest that's going to be joining us, and I'm very excited about that. I do want to, however, before we get into that, help folks that may be new to um, under hearing about the SBIR program, give them a little bit of context for that. So if um, you haven't heard of the SBIR program, it is a great way to start with the federal government. Uh, it doesn't require previous federal experience. It is um, non-dilutive funding, meaning there's IP protections for the, the, the um, work that's developed and, and conducted under the contracts. Um, and it's a, it, just really a great way for innovative R&D small businesses who uh, is defined as 500 employees or less um, to, to connect with us. As you can see, it's a three-phase structured program. Um, we will take an internal poll and gather some challenges or gaps that we have for technology, and we're not exactly sure how to solve them. And then we'll come out to the small business industry and, and, and folks and say, hey, we're looking for your ideas on how to get some solutions here. And later I'll be talking a little bit more about the exact topics that are in the, the coming solicitation. But um, so, you know, it will start with the seeking of proposals for a phase one where you will receive $150,000 and five months to be able to prove feasibility. We generally will award roughly three per topic so that we have the opportunity to explore different um, ideas and, and mitigate some of the risk to this innovation. And then the phase one awardees will be eligible to submit for a proposal for the phase two, which is an opportunity to obtain a million dollars and have two years to be able to develop a prototype that can demonstrate the capabilities that we're seeking specifically under the topics. From there, you know, there's there's ability to go to a phase three. And a phase three is, you know, defined as commercialization, but it really is more better described to me as non-SBIR funding because my program funds phase one and phase two, but we're looking for you to be able to transition or commercialize the technology. And that can be done under phase three as well through further R&D or T&E, test and evaluation. Um, but it's the benefit to having participated in the SBIR program is that can be done under the phase three as a directed award. So we don't have to do further competition. Legislatively, it says we can we can move forward without doing the normal um, re redo of competition because it's saying we've already satisfied that as part of the phase one and phase two work. And we can do this cross agency. So if you start something at DHS within the SBIR program and there's overlapping capabilities needed at other agencies across the federal government, you can um, work with them in the same way, which is fantastic. Um, so that is you know, basically the SBIR program. Like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about the specific topics, but first I'd like to, a chance to be able to chat with the fantastic guest who has done a, a great service in agreeing to, uh, to meet with us today. Um, so Sarah Todd is the Acquisition Policy and Legislative Executive Director from DHS Office of Chief Procurement Officer, OCPO, uh, as it's otherwise known. And that's a really long title, and I'm very proud of myself for getting it out. Um, so hopefully you can provide some more enlightenment on what all those words together mean. Absolutely, Dusty. Thank you for having me. Um, Sarah Todd, as you said, from the DHS Office of the Chief Procurement Officer. I'm the Executive Director of Acquisition Policy and Legislation. Um, that means I do things like the Homeland Security Acquisition Manual, the Homeland Security um, Acquisition Regulation, and also manage the procurement authorities for DHS. Uh, super excited to be here. Great. Thanks so much. Um, I'm sure, I mean, that's, this is clearly a, a serious undertaking. And I'm sure that there's been a lot of, of work that you've done in your career up till now and your background that will help feed this as, as you move forward. Can you talk about your background and really what, what got you to where you are today? 
Sure. Um, like many folks, I think I came into procurement by a happy accident. Um, but before coming to government service, I was actually a small business owner in private aviation. Um, and so um, that's given me a pretty unique lens, having been on both sides of the contract as, as a contracting officer, but previously having been a small business owner. So um, I joined the government at Treasury as a contract specialist, um, and then I transferred to a DHS component and spent about nine years at Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, including a stint in the Office of Management Administration and was the Deputy Head of Contracting Activity before I left there to come up to the department in my current role. And I've been here for a little over two years now. But one of the things I really love about DHS when I came here was the mix of authorities and pilots and all the innovations that we do. So coming from an agency that was very established and sort of had a policy and procedure for everything that they do, to DHS, who was a fairly new agency when I arrived, it was really fun and exciting. And I think it also helps um, to see both sides of that coin from a supportive policymaking perspective at the department now. Um, <clears throat> to, to be able to really make sure that we're keeping as much flexibility as possible, we're being as transparent as we can while still accomplishing all the things that we have to accomplish. I mean, that is absolutely impressive. And I, and I love all of the context and all the things that you're, you're putting in there. And I, I, I also came from, from DOD, so a more established um, agency. And there are definitely some things that was like, oh, this is really interesting, the way the DHS is able to approach us having been established more, more newly. So I think that that is um, certainly beneficial. And I've seen it. Um, you know, OPO, which is, is part of OCPO, the operation, the Office of Procurement Operations um, has done a phenomenal job in supporting the SBIR program. And I always attribute that. I've worked, like I said, multiple places, always connecting with um, contracts and the, the wonderful contracting folks that I've, I've worked with have always had phenomenal leadership to be able to do that. That's what they, they need in their support. Um, and we first connected um, over the the legal ex the legislative expiration of SBI or looming, um, and happily it was reauthorized. And I very much was um, pleased with the conversations we had that we're always driving towards. Okay, if there is an expiration of the program, how are we going to make sure that we're still supporting? these small businesses and being able to produce the things that we've asked them to produce. So I'd love for you to be able to talk about that commitment um, that DHS and the value that DHS does see in partnering with these small businesses. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's harder than you might think to ensure that DHS doesn't lose our important non far based authorities and flexibilities, because many of them are granted for a period of time, not necessarily in indefinitely conferred. Um, but small business is like the backbone of American economy and small business contracting has a very special place to DHS acquisition. So, in fact, we are the only large agency to have received an A or an A plus from the SBA's Small Business Scorecard for 13 years in a row now. Um, so we're really proud of that. And that shows the commitment that DHS has to small business contracting and all of our small business programs. And SBIR is a unique program specifically for small businesses. So it's something that we get pretty excited about. Um, at DHS, our procurement vision is to be the premier procurement organization in government where people are empowered and valued as enablers of mission success. And we know that we absolutely cannot achieve that without strong and effective industry partnerships. And that's what this program supports. I, I'm always speaking, as like you said, to the, the economic benefits of this. Not only, it, it's not this, the small business aspect, of course, is, is very, very crucial, and that's important across all aspects. But then within the SBIR, that innovation and the intellectual property and the advancements we're making is really a strong point that's been foundational for our country anyway. So, you know, being able to continue that is, is certainly something that I, I love about the program. So this is, I, I felt that connection. So I'm glad to, that we had the chance to, to talk about it here, too. So... Um, OCPO, as I said, Office of Chief Procurement Officer, got it right again, um, recently released their 2022-2025 strategic plan. And there was a, a quote that I thought was really, um, it caught my eye. And I'm going to read it to make sure I don't mess it up. So at the foundation of our priorities are four key words, empower, collaborate, innovate, and procure. And, you know, the procure I expected. 
Um, and the collaborate, yes, but I, speaking to the thing earlier, like empowering, I think is important, um, being able to ensure that the, the contracting folks can really support us like they have. And of course the innovate, you know, that's not something that's commonly associated with procurement in, in the government. Um, so I, I'm curious how you put those things, how you incorporate those into your leadership. Yeah, absolutely. No, it, it's true that most folks don't usually associate those words, especially innovation with government contracting, but I think we've done a great job here really pulling that into our culture um, through the Procurement Innovation Lab, through, you know, supportive policymaking and the supportive oversight that we have, and we all work together. Um, so at DHS, obviously, um, the procurement vision we have to equip, enable, and empower our folks. So there's 1,500 contracting officers, and contract specialists at DHS. Leadership cannot be present for every decision that's being made. So the only way to do it is to really, again, equip, enable, and empower them to, to do it. It's really the best way for us to support those missions is um, through those words. And it starts at the top and filters all the way down. Like I said, we've really pulled it into to our culture. And so it's something we're really proud of. 1500 sounds like so many but they are they're doing a lot of work i mean that that is a lot of people but they are doing a lot a lot a lot and i always appreciate everything that they're getting done I and mean, i'm always amazed by how much they do get done so again kudos to to the organization for that um and and kind of broadening that a little bit there's so many places you know and you mentioned earlier the far, far based authorities and then there's also things that the far calls out that we have to make sure that we're doing and and fundamentally it's it's you know as contract is always about two people making sure they agree so that you know going forward they both are on the same page about what's going to get done so it's important for all those aspects to be covered um and the far helps with that um, but I think that sometimes that's viewed as, as being difficult to maintain all of those best practices, lessons learned that are incorporated in the FAR policies with remaining agile and being able to partner with, with small businesses, especially in a way that is, that is beneficial for both parties. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in, in how you guys work for that. Yeah, sure. Um, so as the primary acquisition authority that we have, you know, the FAR offers significant opportunities to efficiently deliver mission needs. And there's a lot of flexibilities in the FAR that we take advantage of. Um, so leveraging those acquisition flexibilities, we're able to efficiently obtain across the gamut, really, research and development services, structure module contracting that supports our IT development and iterative prototyping, rapidly procure commercial products and services using the $7.5 million simplified acquisition procedures. Um, so the FAR has never kept us from delivering mission to our customers. But I admit it can seem onerous at times. So um, there's a lot of benefits of standardizing practices over time. Um, and I'm really big on expectations. So I don't think industry wants to be surprised. Um, standardizing practices for government and industry can be a really positive thing. So we need to keep those practices updated and agile enough to account for best practices and improvements. Um, and I'm not a fan of doing something the same way because we've always done it that way. So DHS, again, is really a leader in procurement innovation. And that's something, again, that we're proud of. Um, industry needs to know what to expect from us. And that's why we engage so much at a high level on what we're doing. So we also now offer the DHS Procurement Innovation Lab Bootcamp specifically for our industry partners so that they can know what we're doing, have an opportunity to see the latest techniques we're using for evaluations. We want to be transparent and that's really a big goal of ours. And it's sort of a pillar of our strategic plan. That Procurement Innovation Lab is just amazing. Um, we use that actually uh, to get the uh, contract for our SBIR portal. So uh, it was, and it was a great experience and um, it was a really different approach to, to how we were able to do it. And so I, many, many ways I've seen the commitment and the innovation that has been um, established throughout the organization. So it's, that's fantastic. So, that um, I'm going to now go to, don't go away, because we're going to take some questions from the audience. So if you're listening in and you have questions, please use this opportunity to get them in so we can get a few questions asked. I know, Sarah, you're very busy and I want to honor your time. So I'm going to go quickly through some slides to let folks know about the, the current um, upcoming opportunity. And then we'll do a few questions. So um, 
as uh, as you may have known, um, based on learning about this webinar, the 23.1 pre-solicitation is, is now out. And there are seven topics. So these cover the um, areas that we I spoke about earlier where we went out to the um, community within DHS and I said, okay, what, what do you need that you're not really sure how to get to um, the solution to? We can go out with topics and we can ask small businesses to give us their ideas, but not let them lose any of their, their data rights or their intellectual property through the SBIR program. So these seven topics, here's the titles. We're not going to go through each of these in detail. You will need to, to, to um, read them. Um, um, in the presentation, there is more. There is more detail, and there's a, a bitly there um, on the screen. But we're um, supposed to be posting it in the chat, um, so folks can use that to get to the solicitation. So you don't have to. But if you go to sam.gov and you Google or, or search D, um, DHS SBIR, it should be the first thing that pops up. So there's plenty of easy ways to, to get to it. But more importantly, well, as importantly, um, we also have some dates that we wanna make sure everybody is aware of. So the current pre-solicitation ends December 14th at 5 p.m. That is tomorrow. So that is the date and time by which if you have specific questions about the topics that were just on the previous page, as you read them in the solicitation, again, read them first. But then if you have questions about those, you can send an email now directly to a topic POC, and they will be able to respond to that. Now, we're not going to be able to say, hey, do this approach or do this approach, or we think that's a good idea or not. We can provide clarification. So just to set expectations there. But right now, if you do that, you're going to get a direct email to a, a topic POC, and you're going to get a direct answer. If you don't get that in by December 14th at 5, then you'll still have a chance when we, when we post the opening of the solicitation. Now, the Dates below are estimates. These are what we're planning for. There can be changes, so stay tuned and, and you know, we'll sign up for our um, email and I'll tell you how to do that later. But that way you'll get the most up-to-date information. But we're hoping to go out with the solicitation opening on the 15th and then there'll be an opportunity for you to submit questions through January 4th. Now, the key difference here is that you're gonna be submitting those to either our office or the contracting officer that um, posts the solicitation. And then we're gonna gather those and we're gonna get the answers to those. And we're gonna post those as part of the publication of the solicitation on SAM.gov. So those will be open for everybody to see. So if you're looking for a clarification for something that you think may divulge your, your um, secret sauce to your great idea on how to solve it, um, now's a great time to make sure you're getting those questions in. And then of course, um, there'll be a solicitation close. Make sure you're prepared to meet that solicitation close. We cannot take um, topics, I'm sorry, proposals past that date. You have to make it. And sometimes there's challenges towards the end, um, but make sure you're doing that early and often because even if you've participated in the DHS SBR program before, there's a reauthorization and that came with some legislative requirements that we have to meet. So there have been some changes. So making sure you're aware of that is very important. All right. So now let's um, get back to Sarah and some, some questions. And um, I wanna start with one that is, is super common um, and, and deservedly so. Um, there's often the question of what advice do you have for small businesses that wanna engage or partner with DHS? Yeah, absolutely. So we really, really, really want our well-performing partners to continue working with us in whatever capacity, right? So for continued R&D efforts, I would say familiarize yourself with what science and technology is doing and where to find it, of course, their solicitations and notices. Um, I recommend before completing phase three, also attend one or more of the DHS vendor outreach sessions or the vendor outreach matchmaking events to learn about all the different DHS components, the offices and future requirements. Um, we offer a lot of those. I think we put some links in the, in the chat box for you guys. Um, vendors can also review the DHS acquisition planning forecast system or APFS for planned future procurements. And that provides information about what DHS is procuring and when we, when we sort of plan to do that. 
Um, I would also say review the DHS budget and specific line items of any specific components of interest and be familiar with the missions of those components and how you can support that. For example, you know, FEMA doesn't buy the same stuff that U.S. Secret Service buys. Um, s and is obviously very unique um, from other components. So look for potential subcontracting opportunities as well. We're really going to focus this year on holding our prime vendors responsible for their subcontracting reporting and their subcontracting goals. And so that's going to be, um, there's going to be, I think, some new opportunities opening up there. And then um, I would say just, you know, be procurement ready. So demonstrating the ability to win and successfully perform on contracts is so important. And you can use the storytelling of your success in the SBIR program to demonstrate your ability if you're looking at more traditional procurement types. Um, and that can be a huge benefit for you. Um, and then lastly, I would say understand how to navigate the various set-asides for small businesses and respond to procurements or opportunities. Um, so it's really important to understand all of the different federal small business set-aside programs and which ones your businesses may be qualified for. For instance, the SBIR, uh, SBIR eligibility is 500 employees, but size standards for non-SBIR requirements differ depending on the NICE code of the acquisition. So research that and be prepared. Um, but you can also contact the DHS OSDBU, the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization, if you have questions and or all of the components have a small business specialist at the component level that can discuss the DHS small business program with you. And their contact information can be found through some of those links. So hopefully that's helpful. Oh my goodness, so much, so much. I mean, I, there's so many things that it's like one, yeah, do research, that's fantastic. Our office participates in both the VOS, the virtual, um, show, uh, sessions. Um, we did a foam for, for the SBIR um, pre-solicitation with them. So great, great, great. Um, yeah, just too many things to even touch on there. That was all fantastic information. So thanks so much. Um, and, and I hope folks were jotting down some, some notes from that. Um, so some of the other questions, um, do candidates have to progress through phases one and two to be able to access the award funding in phase three? So let me give a, a Full answer to this. The, the answer to the question, yes. You have to start with phase one at the DHS SBR program in order to be eligible for phase two, and then to be eligible for being um, awarded a directed award under the phase three. But to be clear, there's not a pot of phase three money. And that's kind of where I was trying to go before is that there's, I have I have a set, the set aside of the SBIR funding that must be done under the program. And I award that under phase one and phase two, but going to phase three, this is non-SBIR funding. So it's funding that's eligible through any other type of procurement. So if we were gonna um, purchase a capability for a, a specific purpose, that would be what would fund that in either case, that whatever was going to be set aside for that funding of that capability from either, like you said, FEMA or Secret Service. Um, did you have anything to add there, Sarah, in terms of the perspective from OCPO or? Um, no, I think that covered it, Dusty. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see, I think we have a few more. I know we don't have a lot of your time, Sarah, so I'm gonna try to pick a couple. Um, will small businesses with existing technology solutions offerings that align with defined objectives be considered? So the SBIR program is for the development of innovative technologies. We aren't looking for things that already exist that can be procured. Our SBIR funding is R&D and cannot be used for procurement. Often folks will contact us and say, oh, we have something that will already take care of that. We do a good deal of market research before we go out with the topics to try to ensure we're not going out with something that does exist. That doesn't mean we didn't miss something. At the same time, I would carefully look, look at it. I always recommend look at what's being asked for. And there's likely a good chance that there's an aspect of it that your technology or what you've already developed isn't going to completely fulfill. You can say, submit a phase one proposal for the development of that aspect. So we need to do further R&D to be able to meet this one piece that our technology currently does not. So that's a great way to be able to fully, more fully develop any technology that you've begun um, being able to, to develop already. Um, but yes, it has to be for, for further development of, of something if you've already started that. Um, 
So this, and it says, well, solicitation is just for phase one, correct? We should not mention phase two items in the, in the proposal, correct? So there is going to be an element where you're supposed to put in your commercialization strategy in phase one. And I highly recommend that when you're submitting your phase one proposal, you're always looking at it from the perspective of how would we get this all the way through? You may not have all of those questions answered, but you've got to start looking at that now and keep planning for that as you go. I know that's challenging, but it's still something that you're, you have to do. This again goes back to reading the solicitation. Make sure you read that carefully. Um, because we do provide in there the elements that we expect to see in phase one as part of the commercialization strategy. So that does incorporate phase two because that's part of how you're going to get to commercialization. And again, Sarah, if there's recommendations on, you know, contracting and getting to commercialization or transition, I welcome your, uh, your input. Yeah, no, I think you nailed it with the read the solicitation too. And, you know, if your, um, if your solution isn't a great fit here, you know, there are some other, um, there are some other avenues that you might explore. There's unsolicited proposals, there's some other things. And so I would say, um, you know, make sure that what you're offering again is, is really tailored to the solicitation um, anytime you're responding. But, um, but again, if you've got those great solutions, we do want to hear about them. Yes, good point. Um, all right, I think we'll do one more and then I'm going to answer some of these questions in the in the last in the final wrap up slide. Um, and so is there a template to be able to hit the key points for each phase? So there is there is information in the solicitation that talks about what you should be putting into into the proposal. There's not a strict template. There's a template for the cover sheet and a template for the cost proposal. But other than that, it's really hard to say this is exactly what you have to put because we're not sure what folks are going to be proposing. So we're trying to remain agile in allowing you to come with solutions and those can take varying forms. Um, and so I, I said that was the last one, I'll do one more. Does DHS have a transition program to assist SBI or phase one, phase twos with successful results to reach phase three and eventual procurement? Yes, we have a couple things that we do. We partner with NSF to allow some of the, our phase one awardees to participate in the i program. You can find out more about that through visiting our site. Um, and then we also have a commercialization assistance marketplace program that we work, that we offer to all of our phase two awardees. And that's something that we help um, awardees understand what that will, that will look like and what those opportunities are. So, and also you can visit our page and find out more information about all of these. So, um, so Sarah, did you have any last pieces of advice or comments that you wanted to share before I uh, tell folks how to connect with us on the social media sites? Oh gosh, I think the policy person probably bored everybody, but um, but no, thank you again for having me and good luck to everybody. You know, we, we love our engagements with industry. I think this is fantastic. Um, and just, you know, don't be a stranger. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I disagree. I think you've been one of the most fascinating guests <laughs> that we've had, so I much appreciate it. All right, so wrap up. Um, there are some ways that you can connect with us. So the, like I said, this is our 12th episode. We've been doing this for five years on the Deconstructing SBIR video series. So there's some things out there that may, many of them are done during the pre-solicitation, but there's also other ones that are, are beneficial to review and learn more about the program. Um, there's a, a links being put into the, the chat. We also have some SBIR success stories. So you can see kind of some of the things that have been developed in, in our past um, SBIR our solicitations and, and see the evolution of them, which is, is key. Um, the SBR portal, like as I mentioned, that will be the um, venue for how you will be submitting proposals to us. You can go out now and create an account and uh, kind of take one of those things that will be uh, to-dos later in the process anyway off the checklist now. And then if you have questions that we weren't able to answer today that because we, we had to wrap up a little bit sooner, um, you can send them to stsbir.program at hq.dhs.gov. We have somebody that is consistently monitoring that email and make sure that we get the right answers and get them to you as quickly as we can. And then to the, one of the points that Sarah made earlier, um, we just released the new partnership guide. And I always say this is even better than hot off the press because we haven't even printed any um, physical copies yet, but you can go and see the electronic format. And the there is 
um, information in there about some of the programs at DHS S&T, Science and Technology. And there's a, a even one page that says, hey, are you a large business? Are you a small business? Are you a domestic, international? And shows you which programs you're eligible to participate in based on, based on those um, parameters. So recommend that. And it also talks about some of the work that we're doing at s and in, in certain areas that's um, beneficial and can help get you started on the research that you should be doing to be a, a good partner for us with DHS. And then somebody asked about the social media. So at DHS SCI, as in science and tech, T-E-C-H, as in technology, so DHS SciTech. Um, is the handle for, we have Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, a YouTube channel, and Instagram. And we do, our, our um, communications division does a great job of working with us to make sure that we're posting on all those sites opportunities, not just SBIR, but other opportunities to partner with us. So highly recommend you follow those to, to stay on top of it. And I, I understand social media, you can pick one and, and go with that one. Um, so Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, I think this has, again, been one of the, my favorite sessions, uh, my favorite episodes, and um, we're looking forward to opening the solicitation and to being able to partner with some new small businesses and find some innovation to help protect the homeland. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>